everyone. My name is uh, Kevin Navratel, political science professor at Marine Valley. I'm also the Democracy Commitment Coordinator. And my two friends and colleagues, uh, Mary Fafuiz Dunkel um, and Darren Schreck, uh, are both political science professors at Marine Valley. They both uh, teach history. And um, Mary Fafuiz Dunkel also teaches sociology. And the, the three of us have been exchanging text messages. Um, we, we typically talk about politics amongst ourselves. And since um, today is July 3rd, and since the uh, debate that took place between um, former President Donald Trump and current President Joe Biden uh, last Thursday night, we've been exchanging some text messages about our thoughts. And what we wanted to do is have a recording to kind of um, share with others who might be interested in some of the questions and thoughts that kind of initial reactions that we had to the debate and kind of um, diving into the, the, the national conversation about, um, you know, whether Joe Biden should step down or no longer run for uh, president in 2024. So before we get into that discussion, I want to have a disclaimer uh, that this discussion is just going to focus largely on whether Biden should drop out. Uh, collectively, the three of us um, have voted for Republicans. We voted for Democrats. Uh, we voted for um, at least one third party candidate, each of us. Um, and so I think I can speak for all three of us in that in an ideal political world, uh, Trump would not be the Republican nominee. Um, however, he's essentially taken over the Republican Party, um, and there's no chance that he's going to be replaced as re the Republican nominee. And there's really no gatekeeping function in the Republican Party currently. Um, we could have, we have had, at least Marion and I have had events on our campus about um, the threat that Donald Trump uh, poses to democracy, um, reasons why we think he should not be running. Um, so we feel like we've done that already. Um, but today, um, in our lack of attention on Trump shouldn't be interpreted as Biden being the more flawed candidate, um, because that's not our position at all. Um, however, within the Democratic Party, there is some debate and discussion about replacing him as a Democratic nominee, and if so, how that process might be conducted. Um, as a recent New York Times op-ed piece stated, the Republican Party um, has been co-opted by Mr. Trump uh, and his ambitions. The burden rests on the Democratic Party to put the interests above the nation, uh, uh, above the ambitions of a single man. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, and I, I think one of the things to just kind of start off is maybe um, going around to, to each of us and, and maybe talking about how our own thinking on this may have evolved and what we personally think uh, the Democrats and Joe Biden should do um, with regards to the 2024 race. So, uh, Mary, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, so, yes, as, as thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for putting this together. Um, initially, yeah, I'm going to just jump right in. Initially, my thinking was, you know, we do, we stay the course. We don't, we don't change uh, candidates at, at this, at this late of the game. Um, I'm not going to deny that, like, personally, I've had my own reservations about whether or not he was going to go for a second term. But I, I, I just kept thinking in the back of my mind that he was not going to, that he was maybe thinking about not doing it and that he didn't want to go for a second term, but didn't want to say it publicly so that it's to not be lame duck from the get go and to not kind of squander political capital. But then he kept saying, he's going to go, he's going to go, he's going to go. I kept thinking, well, maybe he'll do it like in March, maybe he'll do it in April, he'll pull like a Lyndon Johnson in 68, who like at the end of March just announced that he was not going to seek another term. Cause I really didn't think he wanted to go for a second term. I think, and again, I'm not in his mind, I can't predict, but I, I think that his thinking was though that Donald Trump uh, presents such an existential threat that basically he needs to stay in the race to try to defeat him. Um, so I thought, well, you know, this is this is who we're at the dance with, so we got to stick with him. Um, but this debate was frightening. I, as I told both Kevin and uh, Darren, like I, I couldn't watch it. I think I just knew it was not going to be good, and I just I just I don't like watching these things generally anyway. I, I prefer just to read transcripts of them afterwards because they just take too long, and <laughs> I don't have the patience to sit through them usually. Um, but yeah, the debate was was disastrous, and it was you know it was interesting to even see um, the next day the, the you know kind of the commentary from people I've listened to for a long time who were completely on board um, you know saying that they've known Biden for many many years, people that worked in the Obama White House um, saying that he was always, always been on top. They just saw him you know a couple months ago, and um, one of them was John John Favreau who used to work for Obama and saying that you know. Uh, 
Biden asked, how's your wife by name? How are your kids by name? He knew who they are. I mean, this is not a man who's in cognitive decline. Um, you know, he's, he maintains this travel schedule that most people would, I know I would not be able to keep up with at my age, in my 40s. Um, so I, I thought, okay, he's going to have some points where he's not doing too well. But I think what threw me off so much is that because they scheduled this early, his team, Biden's team, scheduled this so early, you know, debates don't usually happen until like, what, September? I think it's like the earliest debate that's happened before. So it's scheduled now in June, and I think it was to show that he's on top of things. So one of the comments I, I heard yesterday on uh, Pod Save America that, that really stuck with me, I wrote it down. Dan Pfeiffer um, was another um, Obama White House person. Um, he's got lots of ex years of experience, but he was saying that, you know, he's got a hard time believing that the Biden team, um, you know, they, he's got a lot of faith in them. And he's like, I, I don't think they would have put him out there with the idea that he wasn't capable of doing the job. So if that is indeed true, and they chose this, they chose the format, they chose the everything about it. Um, it appears that something has changed in just the last couple of, of months. And that's something that the New York Times article was suggesting yesterday, that there's been kind of a precipitous decline just in the last few months. And even advisors have gone, former advisors have gone um, off record, but are saying, you know, without giving their names, but are saying that basically they have seen a change in him. Um, so, you know, you know, he went, he crossed all these different time zones. Again, that would exhaust all of us. But again, the fact that it wasn't just that he had an off night, like Barack Obama had a bad first debate against Romney in 2012. But this is like beyond that. This was like he couldn't even muster up the ability to like counter anything, um, counter any of Trump's arguments and appear to be kind of confused and whatever. And then the next day appeared to be great, which that if you are at that age, you have good days and bad days. I have good days and bad days in my 40s now. <laughs> But obviously this man is 81 years old. And so that has worried me. What happens when he gets to be 85, 86? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that, so because of all of that, and because of the fact that the convention is not until August, and although that there's that whole issue of, do they do, they do the roll call early? Um, which I'm sure we could jump into a little bit more because of Ohio. Um, that's another concern. If, if so we have five weeks maybe, mm -hmm. but I think there's enough time to do it. Um, and I think that the risks, at this point, um, outweigh you know, the, you know, the, the rewards for this outweigh the, poss the possible risks of, of replacing him, which, which is, has its own risks. But I think it, I think it has to be done because I think that, um, and we could get into like maybe who can do it after the next question. But um, I'm just too afraid that the people are so turned off, and they've whether it's fair or not, what I think is a really good record, and I think history is going to judge him very very well. Um, I think posterity is going to judge him if he drops out even better. Like the he he was always a man who put his party, <clears throat> who put his country before his own ambitions and his own self. But yeah, I do think that that's that for that reason that's kind of where I'm at. Where obviously something has changed, um, and that he hasn't given any press conferences. He's, he's supposed to go on ABC at the end of the week, um, but you know why didn't he do that sooner? And again, I know it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback, and I've been very reluctant, as you both know, to criticize, but. I, I just I think it's too dangerous now, especially with this in the light of this recent Supreme Court decision that essentially grants a president immunity while doing any type of official acts as president and official acts could be apparently, I guess, assassinating a political rival if you want to. So, yeah, a lot of great points there uh, that that hopefully we get time to to come Sorry. back to a lot of those. Did I get to, uh, did I do too no, many? Well said. No, um, I look forward to, to talking about more of those, too. Um, Darren, uh, what are your thoughts? Okay, um, I too, going into this, watch, waiting for this debate, Kevin and I were talking about this before we started recording, uh, that immediately, as soon as I saw President Biden walk out on stage, I thought something was wrong. He shuffled, he kind of was very like stiff in his, in his gait. And so you kind of, you know, play that off. And then when former President Trump came out, he looked like he was, you know, a lumbering big man and he doesn't swing his arms. He's kind of hunched over when he walks. Uh, he's a big guy. And so he gets to the, the podium and they get started. And immediately within five minutes of Joe Biden giving his opening statement, he messed some words up like trillionaires and billionaires. And he ended at one point, I don't know if it was in the opening statement, but he opened up one of his statements by saying he defeated Medicare. Uh, and he, he stopped at times during his speech or during his answers. 
Uh, we talked about this in some, uh, some text back and forth. Point one, point two, uh, point one, and point three, and he was confusing himself uh, and trying to make all of these statements about what he had done as president. And I initially like got up and walked out of the room uh, to do dishes or something like that, just to like get out and walk away because yeah. it, it was it was pretty rough to watch. And if you listened to the debate um, as it was going on, you would under you would hear that Biden was talking about issues, and and I don't know what Donald Trump was talking about at times. Uh, there was one that really stood out. There was a question about childcare, and. President, former President Trump brought up something, I think, about Ukraine or Russia or Putin or North Korea. It was still about child care. Then Joe Biden had the chance to talk about child care and just say that, what was the question again? It was about child care. Oh, okay. My opponent didn't talk about that. Instead, he answered what Trump was talking about at that moment. Then they went back to Donald Trump and they were they said remember the question is about child care and he still went back to the issue of whatever he brought up there was a lot of nonsense at during this debate and initially i thought okay well the nonsense kind of threw biden off his game um, but if you listen to some of the issues that he talked about there was one issue that biden could have talked about and knocked it out of the park and that was about abortion and he didn't have a cognitive or a cogent way of talking about how he would be pro-choice for the next four years. That didn't happen. And then his closing remarks, which I don't remember offhand uh, for good reason, because they kind of just reminded me of the entire debate, that it was just a, a train wreck. Yeah. I took it as initially, okay, he just had a bad day. And so I gave myself maybe 24, 48 hours to really sit back and, and think about it and, and to come to the conclusion that he would have to drop out. In order for a couple of things, in order for the country to have a competition between a candidate who has said on day one he will be a dictator versus a, another candidate who is just with it on the issues and maybe in more modern sense, he is young or she is young. They are go-getters and um, that's what the Democratic Party needs. Not just for now, but they need it for the long run. They have a huge list of people they can pick from and I know we're gonna talk about those too, but we've talked, I've said this many times, the Democratic Party has always had this idea that, you know, shut up, this is our candidate, you don't you can vote all you want but we've already predetermined who our nominee is going to be and and i always tell the students that ever since obama ran and won that was supposed to be hillary clinton's year in terms of what the democratic party was thinking so obama wins and then he gets reelected and instead of saying we need to go with this youth movement it's really making sense we need to get somebody in their 40s and 50s they go back and say, okay, it's Hillary's turn. No, Hillary Clinton's term was eight years earlier. Then she loses and they, instead of, and they had to remember at that 20, uh, 2020 debate, they had 15, 20 candidates on the Democratic side. And Jim Clyburn got up and, and remember, Joe Biden was not polling well. He didn't have the support, and it wasn't until Jim Clyburn came out and said, he's our guy, whether you like it or not. And it was like, wow, it's he's sounding like the Democratic Party of 20 years, at least the last 20 years, where, shut up, this is going to be our nominee, and everybody faded away, lost that primary, and Joe Biden becomes the nominee, wins, and for four years, he has done the things, most of the things that he set out to do. But I've always felt that Biden was a transitional president, that he was supposed to be there for four years. Well, the reason why I wanted, I, I came from the perspective of that Biden needs to run again is that nobody else was running. Yeah. I mean, nobody else ran. So it's either Trump or Biden. And 
and, and I'm not going with the authoritarian, you know, in my mindset, I'll go with the person who's in favor of democracy because that's the most important thing that I think is on the ballot right now. But yet he could not articulate that position in that debate. Be there were certain things that happened that I'm watching it. I'm like, Joe Biden is standing there with his mouth wide open. Joe Biden is standing there looking puzzled. He looks confused about issues that were like home runs for the Democratic Party. And he couldn't even like get a single off of it. So there are many people that the, the Democrats can could put up there. And there are many people that the voters, I think, need to see within the Democratic Party who are younger. They have a great bench from a Democratic standpoint that would articulate the positions a whole lot better than somebody who's 81. And one right. other thing I wanted to mention is that uh, David French, who is uh, an opinion writer of the uh, New York Times, said this today on Threads. The age issue isn't just a strategy issue. Can he win? It's a fitness issue. Can he serve? At the current rate of decline, does anyone have confidence he has four more years of effective service? Asking Americans to vote for a potentially unfit man to stop another unfit man isn't just foolish, it's wrong. There are Democrats who are better able to campaign than Biden and actually unquestionably fit to serve. And, you know, you, you have people like you know, former Speaker Pelosi coming out today who said that they needed to have cognitive tests for yeah. candidates. And and I, I don't mean this as a slight, but this is the perspective of the Democratic Party. She's two years older than Biden, and she's saying that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's... It, the Democrats kind of put themselves into this position. And, and I say this part facetiously. Trump said the only reason why he's running is because Biden is running. So if Biden no longer runs, can Trump step down? <laughs> <laughs> so I would say that he needs to be replaced at this point. And I have some numbers that I could, you know, I don't have the chance to share it, but I'll, I'll at least read it to you about uh, where I come from in that position too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and excellent points too. And and uh, I feel like we could talk for hours um, uh, on this topic. And um, before we get into some of maybe the follow ups on some of the points that you raised, I want to uh, you know do the same that you did and, and kind of do a, a brief overview. But I, I think the the context I wanted to share is that in 2016, the day after Trump won the election, the first class that I held, you know, I had several students who were wondering, you know, what are the Democrats going to do? Who could beat Trump the next time? And um, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but I did um, point out to that class that that Biden was going to that I thought Biden would be the best candidate in, in 2020, in part because of the blue wall. Um, you know, uh, Biden being from Pennsylvania and um, and, and really having kind of an appeal with some of the voters who Democrats had lost, especially the white males without a college degree, I thought um, that that Biden would be the, the most um, competitive candidate for Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Um, going into 2020, 2020 um, I thought that um, despite the 15 or whatever competitors that he had, I, I thought um, I remember having a lot of discussions um, with younger Democrats who wanted a much more liberal um, candidate. Oh, thanks for joining the, the, Sorry, the conversation. Sorry, no, definitely joining us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in the room. Um, that you know that Biden was going to, to Darren's point, going to be a transitional president and was really the, the the best candidate that might be able to unite all the different factions within the Democratic Party, and that there was kind of a, a group of candidates who I think were going to be ready for 2024, maybe 2028, but they weren't quite ready yet. A lot of young governors uh, or senators, people who aren't nationally tested yet. Um, you know, honestly, I don't really know when I finally changed my mind on this, but it could have been just from Thursday. But I, I definitely no longer feel that Biden should stay in the race. I question whether he should even stay in as president the final the, the months. Um, but at a minimum, I think he should focus. It's he, he can't multitask. I think, as Mary pointed out, uh, Darren's pointed out, the stakes are too high. Democracy is on the line. Um, you know what a second Trump term would look like. Um, you know, Project 2025 and, and so many other things. I think the stakes are too high, not only for the presidency, but for uh, House of Representatives, for the key Senate races. 
um, I really worry that uh, Biden has the ability to, to drag down all all three sure. of those branches of government. Uh, I'm sorry, all three of those chambers with the House, Senate, and, and presidency. Um, and, and a few of the reasons why I give this um, point of view of, of Biden should step it down. I, I worry that he can't um, he can't campaign, step down from the from the presidential race. Um, he needs to be able to be out there um, giving interviews. I was really surprised that he couldn't give a Super Bowl interview, um, which is something that recent presidents have done. It's just a great opportunity to reach a huge part of the population. And, um, you know, part of the reason I think some of us may have been hesitant or not fully aware of, of maybe where he was at cognitively and energy level and so many different things is he's been hidden from the public. And uh, you have to question why he has, you know, with modern presidents, the fewest um, interviews and press conferences and so forth. Uh, he's just missing huge opportunities and to the point of whether it was a one bad night type of deal like Obama had in, in um, what was it, 2012. You know, the, the narrative with, with Biden has been for years about his being too old and, and, and whether he's, you know, cognitively fit and to come out after five days rest and Camp David and preparing for this and calling for this debate and having that be your performance, you know, it raises a lot of red flags. Um, and since then, you know, I, I was telling you, all, I think with text messages, then why not have like a, a late night TV type interview to follow up? And, you know, granted he had his uh, rally in North Carolina, but that was a teleprompter. So I just don't think he can meet the moment. He needs to be out in battleground states. He needs to be giving interviews. He needs to be more public, visible to the public. And I, I worry that his, his closest insiders, including his wife and uh, sister, um, are really protecting him. And we've, we've had these stories from the New York Times and others that saying that he basically is really only active between um, 10 a.m. And, and 4 p.m. So. We do have this interview with um, George Stephanopoulos. Uh, I think the first part of it's going to drop on Friday. So I think he has a, a small window to maybe write this ship, but I just don't think he can do it. Um, you know, um, about 80, nearly 80% 80 of Americans thought he was too old, um, you know, months ago, uh, years ago. And so, you know, as you both raise, can he do this job for the next four to five years? I think is a big question. Um, Another point is that there's just he did defeat Donald Trump in 2020. So there is this argument amongst Democrats that he and he alone can beat uh, Trump because he did beat Trump, but he did so barely. He did so by roughly 45,000 votes spread amongst three states. And one of the things that um, I, I didn't even remember is I was going back through today of looking at the, the national polls back in 2020 and going through the entire year of 2020. And at this same point in 2020, Biden had a 9% uh, when you take all the different polls, um, because some of them varied from a 5% lead to 15% lead. But on average, he had a 9% polling advantage nationally at this point. Um, he had a 7% advantage nationally uh, in the latest uh, polls right before the 2020 election. He ultimately won the popular vote with 4.4%. Um, and by by having a 4.5% or 4.4% uh, national popular advantage, it translated into winning the Electoral College again by 45,000 votes. This time around, um, he's down. Um, today, the, the Siena uh, New York Times poll had him down 8% with registered voters, 6% amongst likely voters. Um, he has a uh, poll since the debate have shown him losing a two to three percent. Um, his margin with Trump has dropped even even lower by about three percent. Um, he's down in every single swing state. Um, he's down. And this is the part that I think really stands out to me. Um, Democrats have done very well in a lot of elections in, in the last four years. They overperformed in 2020 compared to historical standards. They've won a lot of special elections. And if you look, um, this came out today in today's New York Times. Um, is a, a Nate Silver, a, the title, but was doing nothing about Biden as the riskiest plan of all. And he's basically saying that it's not the party that is uncompetitive, the Democrats, it's, it's Biden. And he's basically showing that um, that there's five presidential swing states that also have um, Senate races up in 2024. 
and those are Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. And in those states, there's been 47 nonpartisan surveys conducted since Biden and Trump have emerged as the nominees. In 46 of those 47 polls, the Democratic Senate, Senate candidate has polled better than Mr. Biden. He and the uh, Senate candidate performed equally well in one poll. So basically, Biden is under, it's, it's not that the Democrats are um, unpopular compared to Republicans, it's that Biden's unpopular compared to Trump. And so I think this argument that only Biden can win is not true. Um, and I, I think he's destined for defeat. And um, one other point that I initially started with when I was thinking about this, back when I was in graduate school, I remember doing um, you know, research and reading books about how there's, there's moods in each election cycle. And I think if you think about the national mood that it's not just in the United States, but internationally, that there's kind of an anti-elite, anti-establishment. There's a lot of anxiety about rapid changes technologically, culturally, and um, high inflation you know, is a real concern amongst people. And they largely attributed that to Biden, I think wrongly, but it is what it is, perception is reality. And I just don't know that an 81 year old candidate um, who, rarely talks to the people and when they do stumbles and loses their train of thought is the right candidate for this moment. So for that, for those reasons, I'll, I'll stop and say that I think that that Biden should should also stop and he should stop running for the 2024 um, election. So I think maybe it might be worth pointing out maybe what are some of the reasons why Trump, or I'm sorry, why Biden should stay in the race. And it isn't necessarily our own arguments, but just arguments that are out there um, of why Biden should stay in the race. And Mary, you've talked about how he's been historically a pretty good president. He's gotten a lot mm -hmm. done. Uh, he's mm -hmm. gotten a lot done despite um, having very narrow margins in the House and the Senate his first two years, mm -hmm. and then facing off against a, re a Republican House of Representatives in the last two years. So what are some of the arguments of why Biden should not drop out? Well, one of the arguments is, you know, who does he get replaced with? You know, we have somebody who already, we already know kind of what the negative arguments are against him. And of course they're, they're pretty formidable. And again, I'm having a little harder time arguing this now because, you know, than I was a couple of days ago, as you both have kind of indicated too. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is that if you put somebody in there who is not battle tested, like it's really hard to prepare anybody for a general election. So you're essentially throwing somebody into the wolves. So unless they've already been through it, which kind of this bleeds a little bit into question number two about, you know, maybe who could possibly replace him. You have to put somebody in there that you know is not going to kind of like peter out the way that Ron DeSantis did, right? You got like Ron DeSantis, who was like, you know, that the Republicans were looking at as going to was this great hope that was going to, you know, uh, overtake Trump and learn, and he got out there and it basically like kind of just fizzled out along with many other candidates who were, who were pinned as supposed to be the, the great next hope of whichever party. So part of it is, is a concern that whoever you put in there next, um, you know, are they going to be able to handle the general and what's going to come out about them in the meantime? Um, and is that going to be enough? Is that going to, is the change going to be too much? That's, I mean, it's one. And that the, the person who is the most, um, seems to be most next in line, just Kamala Harris, was polling before worse than Biden was. Now, I think that that could possibly, that, sh that, that could shift. I think it would shift if she was the nominee. Um, but I think that's one of the arguments that was given for just kind of stay the course and don't don't change it. So that's one. I have others, but like I said, I'm having a harder time, and I'm sorry for Daphne participating um, in this as well, along with me. <laughs> you said that's one, but I I think that is a huge one, and yeah. um, I think that the the chaos, the potential chaos of the various factions. So. One of the things, it, it could certainly be Kamala Harris, who's part of the ticket. Um, if, if I were to guess, I would, I would say there's a better than 50% chance that, that um, she would be the um, nominee. Uh, I think that's what Biden would want. Biden's a fiercely loyal person. Um, I think that we were talking uh, before we started recording, Mary, you brought up that James Clyburn has essentially said that if Biden were to step down, that it should definitely be, that, you know, without question, it should be Kamala. Um, so I think one of the concerns here at this point, if you were to open up, um, 
you know, the Democratic convention to, 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 to any candidate. And if Kamala were to get passed up, when I was talking earlier about all the different factions within the Democratic Party, certainly one of the core constituencies is uh, African-American voters and the way that um, passing up the African-American vice presidential candidate, um, you know, another key core constituency is women, the Democratic Party, and, and maybe passing over a, a black woman candidate. Um, just the way that that um, could really, and Democrats have really um, lost some support um, uh, with my, uh, minority groups, uh, especially African Americans, in recent years. I mean, certainly they still have a majority who support. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a clear uh, advantage that Democrats have amongst African American voters. That being said, it's not as, as high as it once was in terms of the proportion of people who indicate that they would vote for a Democrat. Um, and so just this civil war that, you know, those of us who have read about, I wasn't alive in the 1968 uh, Democratic National Convention that was also in Chicago, but, um, you know, you, you ended up, Darren, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, going back to the original, the original question, it's, it's really, for me, I think the public looks at it from the perspective of certainty versus the unknown. So if you have Trump, if you have Trump versus Biden, okay, well that's what my mind was fixated on, and if you're going to tell me that Biden has to drop out now in order to for uh, you know for a Democrat to win, well I can't handle that because I don't know what's going to happen in the next three or four months. And just recently, I'm just looking at it now. Five minutes ago, it was posted on Threads that President Biden on a campaign call uh, that just wrapped up said, "Let me get this. Let me say this as clearly as possible." Uh, that I can uh, as simply and straightforward as I can. I am running. No one's pushing me out. I am not. I'm not leaving. I'm in this race to the end, and we're going to win. Now it's possible that you know Biden could win. I understand that, but let's go back to what was said before. You know that I mentioned before. For another four years, you're going to have an 85, 86 year old person in office, and who's going to be calling the shots? And people are already asking now. Who's calling the shots? So I, I still hold on to it that the reason why people want Biden to stay there is because it's just going to keep everything certain that this is who the nominee is going to be, and we're going to deal with the cards where they fall later on. And uh, the the issue with that, however, is that you're making a decision now that may have an implication on the future of this country's democracy for the next four years. So. I'm going to go also to what Mary said about, you know, you have these candidates who are, I, you know, these people who were thinking about who might be a, a better Democrat to run who have never run on the national scale before, you know, running it for governor and running for senator or, or representative in the House is a totally different bird than r running for president. You have to know the nuances of what people in Nevada like versus the people of Florida, versus the people of North Carolina, and how the people of Michigan are different than the people of Wisconsin, and so on and so forth. And you, you have to have a certain talent for that. The problem is, is that Biden is a little bit, a little bit tired, you know, in, in trying to convey his message out there. And going back to what you said, Kevin, about 1968, the reason why we have a primary system the way we have it today is from something called the 1970 mcgovern Fraser Commission, where we essentially said that when we vote in the primaries, the primary vote matters, and that's how the delegates are going to be split up, essentially, at the convention. You already know who the nominee is going to be before you get to the convention. So the convention is basically just a, a beauty contest. It's already, I don't know what's going on there with my background, but all of a sudden, <laughs> there's fireworks going really on. Good I, must point. Said, I must have said something that like set it off. Holy cow. Celebration. I'm have a dog walk behind me. Yeah. <laughs> So what happened is I'm going to watch the language then because I'm afraid to see what's going to come up if I say the wrong thing. So what happened in 1970 scary, is they came scary. up with a commission to make sure that the delegate system mattered. The reason why is because in 1968, the person with the most delegates essentially was Robert Kennedy. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. The person with the most delegates after he was assassinated was Eugene McCarthy. Uh, however, the Democratic Party didn't want Eugene McCarthy, who was a far left candidate at that time. Uh, to be the nominee. So what they did is they asked Vice President Humphrey, would you like to be the nominee? He said, sure. 
the delegates were released to Humphrey and Humphrey did not run in one single primary. Uh, he became the nominee and lost. And you saw at the Democratic Convention in Chicago, complete chaos. Everybody saw it firsthand. But, you know, it's not the only time we've had crazy conventions in 1924. For example, it took the Democrats 103 tries to get their nominee, who was John Davis. He did not start off as the nominee, but at that time, Basically, the party leaders and the bigwigs were choosing the delegates. So what happens now, even I just read something that James Clyburn said that we may even have to want uh, for a, a mini primary in the next four months. And I'm thinking to myself, how are we going to do that? So if, if I want to keep Biden as the nominee simply because of stability, that's not a good reason for it. And, and nobody is going to believe um, nobody is going to believe his uh, record anyway. Nobody believes the data. So no matter what he was saying at the debate, it didn't matter. Nobody believed it anyway. Yeah. So um, in order for him to stay as the nominee, he's going to have to simplify things. He's going to have to get out in the public, and I don't know if he could do either one. And uh, to answer the other question, to answer the original question, it's because of certainty versus the unknown. That if we just keep it Trump versus Biden, I understand what's going on. But if Biden were to step down, which I don't think he will, but if, if Biden were to step down, what's next? And I think that's a big fear amongst many people. Can I, Kevin, can I make one quote? Which is because it's actually part and parcel to what Darren just said. Um, it's from Professor Alan Lixman. He's the guy that's got the, the 13 keys to predicting who's going to win the presidency. And he's saying that the party in the White House has never won an open seat with an uncertain or, or contested nominee, nominee um, since the 20, you know, since the dawn of the 20th century. So that's also just another another reason if you're talking about why to, to stay the course and why not to change it with ballots already being printed and things like that. That kind of goes to what Darren was just saying. Yeah, and I think he basically said it would be crazy for the Democrats to replace Biden. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, so a lot of great points there. I, I think. Um, <clears throat> To point out that in a convention at this point, since since Biden won uh, the majority or pretty much all of the delegates, that um, you would have to unbound those and open it up. And the way that having party insiders decide the candidate for the first time since 1968, which didn't go over well at all with the public, and um, ultimately for a lot of different reasons, resulted in a lot of violence in the streets of Chicago. Um, Grant Park and Michigan Avenue and so forth, that there's just a lot of concerns that this could be um, uh, another version of that. And again, I think that just having all these different factions within the Democratic Party and, um, you know, people like Gavin Newsom, and I, I'm not necessarily trying to leapfrog into that part of it yet, but people who, who think that they're next in line as a Democratic standard bearer, you know, J.B. Pritzker, uh, Whitmer from Michigan, and you know, some senators, the list goes on and on, and, and just that kind of fighting, uh, jockeying for position, maybe who's vice presidential candidate, um, could could be um, a, a downside for Democrats. I, I also think it could be an upside. I mean, it could it could be um, must watch TV. You know, a lot of Americans might find be clearly Americans are not happy with these two choices right now. I mean, that is obvious and. I think we often lose sight of that. So shaking up this race um, and, and potentially the many primaries and getting the American public, at least on the Democratic side involved, um, so close to the election could be the shot in the arm that the Democrats need. A um, couple of other points. Yeah, invigorating. A couple other points about um, why uh, Biden should stay in the race. Um, there was an article in the Atlantic today um, I want to say it was Stuart Stevens, but it's one of those, um, the Lincoln Project Group people who were former Republicans who uh, had kind of gone on a mission to um, attack Trump and, and um, try to defeat him both in 2020 and 2024. I uh, was saying that Trump is a candidate of chaos, uh, uncertainty, and erratic behavior. Dr Democrats can win a race against him by offering Americans the opposite, steady, calm, confident leadership. And that, that was a quote. Um, uh, from an article in today's Atlantic, and I think that in a lot of ways, Biden can, you know, those are some of his strengths, uh, some of his personality traits that I think um, that made him a transitional president, that that maybe that steady uh, leadership is 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 what the Democrats need right now. 
Um, it would be undemocratic to have party insiders just kind of plant a, a, a new uh, candidate for us without the Democratic voters' input. Um, I think there's also um, an argument that, you know, one of the reasons that Hillary Clinton lost in 2006 to Donald Trump was um, how poorly she did with whites, especially white males, and um, Biden has done better. You know, whites are the uh, still majority of uh, uh, voters in the United States, and so it's a huge constituency or huge demographic group that um, that you need to be competitive with. Uh, you can still win an election by losing um, uh, white voters, but it's the margins of how much you lose by. And I think one of the things that Biden did well is he kind of cut into the margin that Trump had in 2016. Um, and I. I, I Maybe we already said it, but just to repeat, I think Biden's been a very successful president. He's got a lot of uh, bipartisan um, accomplishments and infrastructure and chips act and um, so many more. Um, but that's again, not really the point of this of whether he's been a successful president, it's whether he can continue to be a successful president. And I think as we pointed out, there's just a lot of concerns that the American people have um, about him being able to um, stay healthy, stay mentally fit, um, being able to lead a country in very uncertain times globally. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention, and I'll turn it back over to you, is that um, another kind of downside with Biden, the, the war in Gaza has been awful. Um, you know, there's also a war in Ukraine. Both, war, both of these wars are awful, and I'm not trying to have a competition of which one deserves more sympathy. There's all kinds of international events happening. Um, I think there's a horrific situation going on in Sudan. I could go on and on. But I think on the Democratic side in particular, um, it's been a, a huge dividing mark of uh, what's been happening in Israel and, and Gaza and Palestine because there's some, you know, two huge demographics on the Democratic side. Um, uh, Jewish uh, people of the Jewish faith, um, overwhelmingly Democratic voters, some of which have felt that Joe Biden has not been supportive enough of Israel and, you know, needs to be um, stronger in his support for Netanyahu and Israel um, or anti-Semitism that's going on on U.S. campuses. Um, also, um, key uh, demographic uh, voting bloc for Democrats, uh, Arab voters, um, people of the Muslim faith. And especially in swing states like Michigan, um, uh, these are, are key voting groups that Democrats need to have. Uh, in 2016, I think Michigan was lost by like 11,000 votes, right? I think Democrats won it by over 100,000, maybe close, closer to 150,000 votes in 2020. But the argument is, is that these voters are really important. Um, and so Biden, uh, rightly or wrongly, has alienated both of those groups. Um, and so there is kind of a reset that having somebody who's not Joe Biden um, could potentially help with um, kind of bringing back some core constituencies to the Democratic Party, because I think there's just a lot of apathy, alienation in people who feel that their leadership has failed them. See, okay, so I completely agree with all of that. Um, what has always bothered me for a long time in American politics is that we, especially thinking of the Democratic side, we have this disposition that, you know, it's got to be the shiny new penny, right? It's got to be somebody young and dynamic. And I think that the, the, the argument coming out of the Biden camp about that Trump's ideas are old, right? That, that if you look at what Biden's actually legislated on, He's been, I think, probably whether you like what he's done or not like what he's done, he's gotten the most accomplished legislatively. He got more accomplished in four years than Barack Obama did in eight. So because of Barack Obama's youth, and that was one of the things that Bob, that actually gave me concern about Barack Obama back in the day was that he was too young. He was too inexperienced. And that's why he ran at that time. He didn't have a record that anybody could pin on him. Right. He didn't have anything to look back on. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I was concerned about him. I wanted somebody who had who had experience, who knew how to work with Congress, who knew how to get bills passed. And that's something that Biden has proved that he can do. But unfortunately, there's this disconnect between, I think, what those of us who are kind of in the in the biz, so to speak, what we know to be true and what people, their perception and perception is reality. But we always seem to have this thing about wanting to go for what is the shiny new thing as though just somehow youth automatically means that you're going to know what you're doing. And it doesn't just because you're young and you're vigorous doesn't mean that you know what, like, you know, you mentioning about Israel, like, 
Biden was on that call with Netanyahu um, the night of the with Iran with the attacks with Iran, and and basically Biden was saying to Netanyahu and according to people that were in the room, um, he, he was this was super late at night. He was forceful, and he's like, if you do this, you're going alone. We're not backing you, and mm -hmm. Netanyahu backed down. So he's proven that he could do these things, and I, I guess I'm starting to kind of drift back towards this argument of of why he should stay on there. And one of the things I think that's also sort of um, I've noticed over the years about Biden is that he seems to have been treated by it with some kind of a little bit of disdain from, I think, more like the kind of the Obama camp. He was passed up in 2016 in favor of Hillary Clinton. Um, and it was basically said that, that he didn't run because Bo was sick. And, and when actually, according to what has also emerged, that Bo wanted him to run um, and was, was in favor of him running. Um, and he just kind of, you know, kept quiet and let them anoint Hillary Clinton. But that probably could he have beaten Donald Trump in 2016. Probably could have. Again, we're, I, I'm playing Monday morning quarterback. I get that. But all these are things that, to me, I guess as somebody, we are people that look at this different than the rest of the American public does. And it doesn't matter because, again, perception is people's reality, and that's how they vote. Um, but it just, it, I think it kind of irks me sometimes that we automatically drift toward this idea that if they're young, that automatically they know. No, it doesn't mean that you know Experience does count for something. But I will go back to, again, this idea of I think we've crossed this line um, of if, you know, he had this perfect moment to be able to demonstrate to people that despite his age, he knew exactly, exactly what was going on and he could still lead the country and he wasn't able to do that. Um, and again, they asked for the debate to be held in June. So if this was happening in September, we wouldn't be able to change anything right now. I'd be like, okay, done. He's our candidate. He's our guy. It is what it is. Um, but it's still kind of early enough that some, something can still be done. So... Oh, and also the anti-incumbency thing throughout the entire world. You mentioned yeah. your point, Kevin. This has been happening not just with people here, but this is there's an anti-incumbency yeah. wave that's occurring. In, in, and I'm not sure what exactly that's stemming from. Um, is it due to social media and the yeah. way that maybe like videos that emerge online and people, again altering people's perception of events? Yeah. Two uh, two quick points on that is. Biden's actually faring better than most Western incumbents, um, yes. in including, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister. Which, so I'm not just saying, well, um, you know, Europe, but also the United States and Canada. Um, Biden has slightly better approval ratings in, uh, than than most Western candidates um, or most Western incumbents. And I think the speculation is um, immigration. Um, which is a global, you know, the number of migrants globally. Uh, inflation is another huge global uh, concern. Um, Darren, I don't know if you had a point. There's two quick points I wanted to make. I don't know if this is going to interrupt what you were about to say, but I was. I'll just say it. <laughs> um, Trump. What would he? Who does he want to run against? Mm -hmm. um, who really knows, right? But I, mm -hmm. I, I think in some ways we might know, because mm -hmm. if he didn't want to run against Biden, wouldn't he be calling for the 25th Amendment and, yes. and other like, hey, you know, right. like, like, no, no, don't do he's, that. Been, he's been pretty <laughs> silent on this, might mm -hmm. be pretty telling. Um, and so the other part is, what would Obama, you know, what does Obama think? And uh, of course, Obama did have a tweet um, shortly after the debate, basically saying he, too, had a bad night. And. You know, I, I can't off the top of my head remember everything that he tweeted, but it was supportive of, of Joe Biden. But yet we're also hearing kind of off record that, um, you know, I think Barack Obama is a very politically astute person. And I think he has communicated to the Biden campaign before the debate that he mm -hmm. had a lot of concerns with the way the campaign was being run and that the likelihood of, of, of Biden being able to defeat uh, Trump. I think he had a lot of concerns about that. And I've heard, you know, through, you know, off unnamed sources that again Biden or that Obama has those concerns and 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 I think is communicating those. And I think there's back channel ways of communicating that to, to, to Biden. And also the other point with that is David Axelrod, who was um was he the campaign manager for Obama in 2008? I think so. A key advisor, yeah. you know, huge, advisor. huge connection with Obama, right? And so he was, he went on record quite some time ago, basically saying he didn't think Biden should run. And that, that's not to say that he's a surrogate for Obama and that, you know, Obama's trying to have his, you know, his, his um, connections say these things. But I just, I would be very surprised if Axelrod would go that route. 
And as Mary, you pointed out, you listen to Pod Save America and Pod, Pod Save the World, and a lot of the former um, staffers for Obama uh, have been yeah. very critical too of, of whether Biden should stay in the race. The uh, the current prime minister of, of the UK, who is not going to be the prime minister of the UK very much longer, is 44 years old. The uh, His opponent is 61. Uh, Justin Trudeau is 51. So when, when I'm talking about a youth movement, what I feel happened and they lost their window of opportunity was to build on when Obama was president, that they could continue to do so year after year after year. So what they did is they just went backwards in terms of like Clinton and then Biden. And now when we see other candidates, we say, well, they're untested. Well, they're untested because the party kind of pushed them yeah, down and said, them. Yeah. you're going to be, you're going to be the Senator and you're going to be a governor and you're going to wait, you're going to wait four years. You're going to wait eight years. And then you're going to come into the limelight. But by that point, their window of opportunity might have been missed. So I found this poll that was done by the Data for Progress on June 28th, a little bit over a thousand likely voters. And it was put out by the Biden campaign. Now, this is what the Biden campaign said about what I'm about to read to you. At the end of the day, we would end up switching to candidates who would, according to the polls, be less likely to win than Joe Biden, the only person ever to defeat Donald Trump. That's spin because the poll shows that every single candidate who is uh, tested against Donald Trump, not one time does Donald Trump get over 48%. With Donald Trump, Trump versus Biden, Trump has 48, Biden has 45. Harris versus Trump, 45, 48. Buttigieg, 48, 47. Booker, 44, 46. Newsom, 44, 47. 44, 46. Uh, Whitmer with the 44. Klobuchar, 43. Trump, 46. Shapiro from Governor Shapiro from Pennsylvania, uh, 43 to 46. And Pritzker of Illinois, 43 to 46. Now, you might look at that and say, well, the numbers are very similar, Darren. So what's the big deal? The, un the unsure is lowest with Biden versus Trump and Harris versus Trump, where it's 7%. So people have already made up their minds about Biden and Harris versus Trump. They've, there, there's very little wiggle room for that 7% in which they're going to go either to Biden or Trump. With Pritzker or Shapiro, Pritzker, there's an 11% unknown or unsure. Shapiro is 12% unsure. So a candidate like them, if they went out and campaigned, I'm not saying they are, but if they went out and campaigned, there's a segment of the population out there that's willing to listen to somebody else other than <laughs> Donald Trump in the general election. The Biden and Harris team, I mean, separately, there's very little wiggle room for them to get that unsure on their side. So this right. was conducted uh, on the 28th. So I'm looking at the date now. If you're looking at the 28th, it was conducted the day after the debate. Yeah. And so Trump only gets 48. Biden gets 45, but the unsure is very, very small with those two. Yeah. And if you did Harris versus Trump, it's still the same numbers and still the same unsure. So the public is, at least Democratic voters, they're looking, or I should say likely voters in general, they're looking for somebody else. They, they're dying for somebody else. It's just the window of opportunity of having that extra candidate come out or that new candidate come out is very small. So for future listeners, and especially some of my American government students who I may have watched this, partly what's happening here is that a lot of these other candidates don't have the name recognition. Right. Um, right. They don't have the national name recognition. And so by having a few months to, you know, have the Democratic war chest behind you of being able to do campaign advertisements, doing interviews, um, doing debates, potentially, there's a, a bunch of potential for those people who are unfamiliar with these candidates to become familiar with, their, and I, with them. And I agree with you, uh, Darren, a lot where it's pretty baked in with Kamala Harris and Biden. Um, and so I think let's speculate a little bit here. I mean, we don't, you know, Biden hasn't stepped down as Darren just stated. Biden's pretty insistent he won't step down. I have a lot of, uh, 
worries that Biden may not step down in part because of his uh, uh, family and advisors who are kind of, uh, I think, out of touch with the American public. But let's just say that he does step down. Um, you know, we can talk. I think we, again, Kamala Harris, I think, has got the best chance of replacing Biden because she's currently on the ticket. She would inherit. Um, she would be the only one to inherit the 210 million plus war chest that they have for the 2024 election. I think that's huge. But let's just play a little bit of uh, the final few minutes here, just kind of yeah. speculating with some of the other candidates of uh, names that are out there. Um, Gavin mm -hmm. Newsom, uh, California Governor Gretchen Whit Whitmer, Michigan Governor J.B. Pritzker, Illinois Governor Josh Shapiro, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew, Andy Bashir, Kentucky Governor. Pete Buttigieg, uh, Transportation Secretary, I know Mary, um, <laughs> um, may have- Mary, uh, Mary loves okay. him. <laughs> okay, all right. I love him. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, uh, Minnesota Senator Raphael Warnock, Georgia Senator Sherrod Brown, Ohio Senator, and those aren't the only names, and you know maybe some of those are outsiders at best, but um, thoughts, maybe Dream Team, um, President, Vice President, um, anybody you personally like, um, yeah. Oh, I can't hear Darren. Darren, are you muted? Oh, there we go. And Pritzker, I would say, has the money to run on his own if he were to do so. And he's also called out Donald Trump in, uh, I don't know, there's that speech that he made at a, uh, I think it was at Northwestern, I can't remember the college, where he basically called out bullies or people who are the loudest, make no sense or have nothing to, to show you or something like that. So he's one, and uh, Governor Shapiro from Florida uh, has a, a, a pretty That's good great. resume in a short, pretty good resume in a short period of time, because of uh, the shutdown of I-95, which was rebuilt like in like a week or two, and he got everybody going. Uh, I, I've always been like kind of hesitant about like senators running, yeah. because they're kind of entrenched with the uh, the institution of the Senate and the the mindset of the Senate. And I think you kind of see that with Joe Biden still, mm -hmm. in the way he discusses issues and talks about people on both sides of the aisle and things like that. He comes from an institutional perspective. And so I would just say a Pritzker or a, a Shapiro, probably like resume wise, I might be kind of short on it, but uh, it might be something that people would be interested in seeing. Yeah. Even even uh, Gretchen Whitmer, she has a story to tell about, you know, the, the insanity of the people who uh, wanted to overthrow uh, the Michigan government and some people wanted to assassinate her. Kidnap um, her and assassinate her? Yeah, you know, during the, you know, during the, uh, the pandemic. So there's, there's a story to tell there to the American public about what's going on in, in the, uh, the deepest uh, crevices of this country and darkest areas of this country. Do you, want, do you want me to go next or do you, do you want to go, Kevin, or do you want me to go next? Go ahead. Um, okay, so as you as you both know, I, I love me some Mayor Pete. Um, I would love to see him, but I don't think that this would be the right. I, I do think, okay, let me say this first. I think it has to be somebody who, because if we're going back to that argument over um, how to run an election, even if you've run in a primary, it's not the same as a general, but at least, are, you know, the oppositional research has already been done. So out of those, those candidates who ran in 2020, you know they were all running oppositional research on one another, on themselves, they've got stuff already. So I, I think it'd be, it would make more sense to have somebody um, who's already run in a primary. Um, and you've got a lot of good candidates from that, that, um, that, that group. Um, I'm more of an institutionalist like Joe Biden, so I actually wouldn't, wouldn't have a problem with it, but I do agree with Darren that I think it would be better personally. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying this is necessarily who I would want number one, but I think that Gavin Newsom, I think would be phenomenal. I think they get, uh, Gavin Newsom is, is governor of California. He's got baggage. Yes, he does. But he is pugnacious. He, he, he will go on Fox News and he will debate. He'll take the debate right to people. He has no problem doing it. Um, I think Trump would be scared to death of him. Um, I think that he's, I think he would just, he would just, you know, I, I, I really think that, that and you're, to your point before, Kevin, about um, who would Trump want to run against. Um, Trump does want to run against Biden. He is scared about running against somebody else. And as far as, as um, so whether it's a Trump, you know, Buttigieg combination, or uh, excuse me, um, uh, Newsom, um, Buttigieg, um, obviously for, for Kamala Harris, she's not going to go on a VP ticket for anybody else. Um, I do see how that would be an insult um, 
it would be perceived as an insult um, to Black America, but they don't all speak with one voice as well. I think that Darren's point is is a good point about that people are are they are dying, they are thirsty for something, right? Um, they want somebody different, and so I think if, if I think Kamala Harris on her own, if she were not part of the Biden team anymore, I think there is a lane for her that she could like she could strike out on her own. I still have a hard time understanding whenever somebody says to me, "Well, she's terrible," I'm like, "Well, what has she done?" Okay, she was given the task about the border, but like. It's a Herculean yeah. task that what, when you've got a Congress who's not doing anything, what could the vice president do? I said, what did Mike Pence do when he was vice president? What did Al Gore do when he was, you know, Dick Cheney did a lot, but do we want that? <laughs> like, I don't know if we want yeah. that necessarily. Like vice presidents traditionally aren't, aren't known for their own platforms and doing their own thing. They're out there, a voice for, you know, for, for within the cabinet. They're, they're part, of the, uh, part of the presidential administration. So she really hasn't been given that opportunity. She's run on her own and her campaign wasn't great. But that was four years ago. I think that like there is a chance for her to kind of stake out a claim, um, and I think that she would do pretty well. And she's argued about um, for abortion rights. Um, she's been very forceful. She's had good crowds. I mean, I think that she really hasn't been given that chance yet. So um, I think those are the people that I think, as I do, I do agree with you. I think that the polling is clear, and I think that I think that in terms of getting people on board, if you want to get your people like Jim Clyburn. And people like that, if you want to get those people on board, you're going to have to go with someone. You have to go with the vice president. Um, yeah. And maybe that's the best possible choice to get at least to get to kind of, you know, we're kind of meeting halfway. Right. It's somebody new. It's somebody different. She's maybe not new, but she's different. Um, yeah. And you're not throwing out the vice president out of that that category, which would be not be the best signal to send to the black community or the Asian community, for that matter, as the first or the female, the first black female um, Asian woman as vice president. Again, though, I, I do reject the idea that people don't automatically vote just simply on identity politics. Um, right. But I do think it would send a, it would send a, it would not be the best look, I think. Right. Um, a few things of uh, thoughts that I have. Um, so we earlier were talking about how Biden missed a bunch of opportunities during the debate to attack Trump, to push back against things that Trump said. Um, and I do agree that Kamala Harris um, and Gavin Newsom, for that point, would be very great, very good at prosecuting, you know, arguments against uh, Donald Trump and being more focused um, in, you know, attacking him, whether it's on abortion or his history when he was president. Um, I'd probably, it, for all the reasons that Mary mentioned, you know, Kamala Harris is the current vice president. Um, I think she's the most likely to replace Biden. Um, I do want to, so just with senators, um, I'll say this first. I, I think that Sherrod Brown was somebody who I also, I was, I, I, I probably preferred Sher Sherrod Brown for the Democrats back in 2020. Um, but he didn't run. Um, I think he would be great. He's from Ohio. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, if it was him or Raphael Warnock, that you're really losing one of the Democratic senators in a, a really <clears> tough <throat> state that a Republican governor would replace them with a Republican. Yes. So you're going to lose a senator, which I don't know is, is something that Democrats should be doing. Um, what I, I would say my top three candidates, I, I'm very focused on the blue wall that I mentioned earlier of Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Um, connected to that, of course, Minnesota, you need to keep that in the, in the Democratic column in, in Illinois. Um, uh, but I think those two, you, you, you're more likely to do so if you have a candidate who appeals well in the three states that I mentioned, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. I, I worry that Gavin Newsom has national appeal, but I don't know how the voters of those three states I just mentioned view him. And I think that Gretchen Whitmer, J.B. Pritzker, Josh Shapiro, um, you know, Whitmer's from Michigan, or governor of Michigan, Shapiro's governor of Pennsylvania. I think those two candidates are very appealing. And then, as Darren mentioned, J.B. Prisker's got buckets of money um, to assist with campaign expenses. Uh, so those are probably my three that I would put up there. Um, if Kamala wasn't the presidential candidate, um, and it was one of those three people I just mentioned, that I think, you know, one of the candidates I think is really, uh, he's not a candidate, but somebody who I'd like to see eventually be a candidate is Hakeem Jeffries. Um, I, although he's angling for the uh, Speaker of the House job. Um, so I think if it was any of those three people I just mentioned, Whitmer, Pritzker, or Shapiro, 
I've started thinking about president, vice presidential candidates um, to pair with them. Again, assuming Kamala Harris is not in. Um, Stacey Abrams is another one that comes to mind. I think she could be very helpful in a place like Georgia, although she lost her own uh, gubernatorial race in the state of Georgia. Um, but I think you'd want to be cognizant of kind of, of, of having um, a vice presidential candidate that provides some sort of, like, I wouldn't pair any of those three people I just mentioned together. Um, mm -hmm. um, perhaps Whitmer in Shapiro or Whitmer in Pritzker. But, you know, I really think um, based on the, the, the future of the Democratic Party and the demographics that have, are, are really key to the Democrat to the Democrats that you would need, uh, uh, you know, a minority um, African American uh, Latino uh, to balance out the ticket uh, to be appealing um, to Democratic voters, especially in the emerging states like Georgia, Arizona, North Carolina. That might be the new blue wall um, going to, you know, future elections and eventually one day, potentially Texas. Um, because I think demographically, I think the Democrats are going to be challenged in places like Wisconsin in the future. Yeah, any final sure. party, um, you know, we, we're just over an hour and I think that it gets too long. It gets hard to watch. Um, so maybe just uh, final thoughts if anybody has. Final things that you know, something that they wanted to get to earlier that they didn't. Um, any other thoughts on the 2024 election? The only thing I want to say that if I'm sorry, and I just let me cut you off, Kevin. This kind of does make me sad because I do feel like, it, and this is some, and this, this is not a um, necessarily a very academic thing to say. It just makes me sad from a standpoint of I, I work with the elderly, and I feel like to a degree. One of the things about Western society that troubles me is I don't think we have a lot of respect for our elders. Um, and part of this does feel like this is a sort of a rejection of somebody who's older. But I do also, when I say that, I also at the same time recognize there is a problem um, and we have to confront it. But I think that overall, um, it does kind of make me sad. I feel like we're, this is a person who has served like his entire life honorably. And I, I think if he does resign, or not resign from the presidency, but if he does say, okay, you know what? Because he, he is the nominee, right? Uh, legally speaking, unless he chooses to give up his his delegates, those are his, legally speaking. They're bound to to vote for him um, at the convention. Um, and I think if he does it, I think that he will be remembered by history as just a patriot who has always put his country before himself and before his own interests. So I, even though it does make me sad um, to see it, I hope that he does do it ultimately. Because um, I do think that that either way he will be judged well. I think he's accomplished the most as a president um, since FDR or even LBJ, like in terms of getting things done. Um, you know, but people kind of that lag sometimes to catch up to realize that. And so, like I said, history is going to judge him very, very well. Darren, if he drops thoughts. out. If he drops out. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, when FDR passed away in 1945, he was 63 years old. Yeah, he was like a really old 63. Yeah, you know, we see true. how you know we've looked at age, and even it, back then, when he ran for president, they all knew that he was ill, yep. and uh, and yep. they still ran him anyway in 1944. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's what you ended up getting. So uh, there's so many changing parts. By the time people listen to this or watch it. Yeah. Uh, who knows what's going to be changing, you know, between now and then. And uh, usually that doesn't happen during uh, this stage of a, uh, the convention period in uh, our political system. So this is all pretty new for all of us, uh, for those who are watching this or listening. Uh, so we're, we're doing our best job at taking a stab as to what's going to happen or what could happen. Uh, I, I still say from the get go that at the start, uh, this election is about democracy versus authoritarianism, and it still is the same way if Biden is on the ballot or not, because the Republican side, led by Donald Trump, isn't going to change anytime soon. And uh, and as we said before, I have voted uh, for every uh, political party there is. Uh, I think there is a clear uh, delineation between both political parties, and one political party is pretty good at getting their message across. And that being the Republican Party and the Democratic Party is kind of uh, at, at a stage now where they're probably wishing that they didn't want to be in, where they have to explain themselves and explain away things about their candidate. This should be the period where they're focused on the, the end game of the uh, 
of the election and uh, they're not at that stage yet. So it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. And Kevin, I want to thank you again and, and Mary uh, for being here and Kevin for putting this together. It, it's a pleasure working with the two of you in the department at the college and talking about these issues. And I appreciate the people who are listening and watching this as well. So thank you for uh, giving us the time too. Thank you. Yeah. You know, this was the first time I think we've ever had any any sort of event in the summer and it was put together just in like 24 hours. So uh, thank you for to, to both of you for that and being generous with your time in the summer. Um, I just, I don't know that I had prepared conclusion remarks uh, thought of, but Mary's made me think of, you know, I just wanted to piggyback on what she was going to, what she said. And um, it it is sad. And I think it has the potential to have implications. You know, I kind of worry about ageism of, of this kind of being, um, stare, you know, that, that, that this scenario could influence other, um, elderly people and, and positions that they may be in still. And, um, but that being said, I also, um, you know, Biden has been, I'm 47, um, uh, Biden has been in government longer than I've been alive. And, you know, I do think that many Americans, we've said that they're unhappy with these two presidential candidates. I think people don't like career politicians, um, generally speaking. I think there's a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience that Biden um, has brought uh, because of his age and how long he served in government. But I also think that people are yearning for something different. And I think it's an opportunity for Democrats to have um, new leadership at the highest position, and it doesn't, it shouldn't, uh, I think Biden has the potential to go out, you know, as a hero if he handles this in a way that I think he should, and that is to say that he cannot multitask of being president for the final few months and campaign the way that he needs to, to um, match the moment. Um, and so- Is it fair to say though, Kevin, Pardon me, I'm sorry. Is it fair to say that no, for the for the benefit of our view, our listeners though, that really it's hard for any president to be able to run for president and also be president at the same time. That's it's an almost impossible task to do both because you have to one has to take more attention than the others than the other, and it's usually almost always if you're a good president, you put the country first before that of your campaign. But it's even harder, right, when you're also 81. One hundred percent, and I, I think with the with also like you mentioned or somebody has mentioned, he has. There, there's two major wars going on. He has uh, the only um, president that I'm aware of that has been to you know battlefields in two different um, yeah. wars while, while being president. Um, and you know, to, to Darren's point about FDR, it's just it, it's 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 also a very different era of what we expect the president to be. And I think a lot of this is just um, what you say unnecessary. But we have put way too much on the U.S. president. We expect yes. them to be yes. um, a king, even though we have a separation of powers, checks and balance system. We expect them to solve every global crisis. Um, we have emotional attachments to them. We expect them to be kind of this national leader in moments of crisis. Um, it's unreasonable. And yeah. so I don't, you know, to, to that point, it, it would be, it's a, Undaunting task for even the fittest of presidents, yeah. and um, but that being said, I think it becomes <laughs> an extreme challenge for those who are not able to devote their full day and full energy to the job at hand to be president and to be campaigning for yeah. president again. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you both. And um, appreciate you. your time and. Um, I'm just going to uh, stop the recording here in just a moment as I try to figure out um, WebEx. It looks like I'm not going to be able to do that right away. So we have a, a screen that is. Um, is there a record video or the record button? Can you just... it, it is, but the problem is, is I can't get it to maximize. There we go. So.